Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Arizona Care Hospice webinar series. Um, this is the first of five classes that we will be having. Um, the first one is nutrition and hydration at the end of life. So I want to welcome everyone to the program this morning. My name is Pat Kratler. I am one of the regional directors of education and compliance for Arizona Care Hospice. And today we're going to talk about not just hospice patients at the end of life, but we're also going to talk about um, residents that reside in nursing facilities, as well as some input for dietitians and hopefully some information for patient and families. We want to welcome um, all of our staff as well as all the providers and uh, supporters of our hospice that are out there. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So the purpose really um, of nutrition and hydration for us is to review the needs and the comfort and whether or not um, there is comfort or distress related to nutrition and hydration during the final stages of life. There are so many um, avenues to talk about and so much research on this topic that this presentation, which is approximately about 60 minutes long, and we will have an opening for you to post some questions if you have questions at the end. And we're also recording this. So should you miss it or have additional questions or want to hear it again, you'll have an opportunity to do that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, nutrition hydration in terms of comfort, distress, and also the regulatory guidance um, that nursing facilities were under as of August of 2013 and what it meant in terms of parental uh, feedings and enteral feedings. So our objectives today is really to understand that nutrition hydration goals are really based on the wishes of each patient. So just to elaborate a little, elaborate a little bit more on that, um, patients, if they are alert and oriented, hopefully will have an advanced directive that clearly spells out what their wishes and needs are. But we find out very often, and we'll touch on this as we go through the presentation, that families don't always agree with whatever the patient's wishes are. So we'll go into that. We'll look at and recognize the responsibilities of the IDT, which is the interdisciplinary team for hospice, um, and how we help residents meet the nutrition and hydration needs. We do have patients that are in group homes, assisted livings, long-term care facilities, and we do meet as a team um, in hospice, as you know, those of you in, in hospice, once every 14 days. And we talk about um, some nutrition and hydration needs and what we need to do to teach patients and families. And so also know that although food and hydration usually provides comfort and nurse, nourishment in the end stages of life or if someone is dying, this may, and I say may, cause distress. And the reason for the distress really focuses on the ability of the body at the end of life to shut down and all the organs in the body is not producing all the different things that it normally would. Disease process takes over. Therefore, it may cause distress if we do provide nutrition and hydration. But we'll give you some examples of that as we go on. We'll also maintain regulatory compliance with nutrition and hydration and artificial feedings. Um, believe it or not, there are specific regulations that nursing homes have to follow in terms of nutrition. And how do we in hospice balance that out with meeting the needs and the regulatory requirements for nursing facilities, as well as meet the needs for our patients and families? And hopefully, for those of you that are listening um, and have logged on from families, hopefully we can provide you with some information and support regarding nutrition and hydration, um, specifically our Catholic families who have a lot of questions about um, not providing nutrition and hydration and what can happen and why they feel we need to provide additional nutrition and hydration. So we'll touch a little bit on religion, spirituality, and some diversity. So in accordance with um, us doing a comprehensive assessment and a plan of care, um, the World Health Organization says that palliative care is defined as active total care of patients whose disease is not responsive to curative treatment. Now for us, it simply means providing comfort measures. So for those people that have elected in their advanced directive or have elected not to receive any additional 
nutrition and hydration, what are some of the palliative care things that we can do as hospice providers? Well, one, of course, is mouth care. We do know that dehydration is not painful. Um, endorphins are released at the end of life that poses them not to be hungry. But that doesn't mean that we can't do comfort measures to their skin, turning and positioning, lotions and comfort, warm towels, and possibly doing some swabs to the mouth. So the goal of palliative care is to really achieve um, the best quality of life for our patients and families. We wanna make sure that we're doing everything humanly possible to make sure not just the patient, but the families are provided education and also comfort for whatever time they have left. So the regulatory requirement for a resident in a facility to achieve what they call the highest level of well-being in accordance with our plan of care applies to any resident at any time during his or her stay in long-term care. So it's not like the regulation, and we'll go into that a little bit further in the presentation, the regulation in nursing homes simply says that we are to provide residents or they're to provide residents for however long they're in there with well-being in terms of the plan of care. In plans of care, the resident plan of care with the facility and the plan of care with the hospice, it's important that we manage that together. And it's clearly delineated in the plan of care what the facility is going to do and what the hospice is going to do and that we work together. There's nothing worse, I think, than not being on the same page and working together as a cohesive team. Perhaps if more hospices did that, um, we would see a lot more um, facilities be more inclined to allow hospice to come into their buildings. So the primary goal of nutrition, hydration, and terminal illness is comfort, quality of life, and so the resident can have the maximum enjoyment of eating. You know, it comes to a point with disease trajectory that enjoyment um, goes with eating. We all know that one of the fun things we do is eat out, eat with families. Of course, now with COVID, we're not going out as much, but eating is still a very important part of entertainment. Um, families view eating, certain cultures view eating um, as something that's very important and enjoyable, and it should be enjoyable. Another goal is to maintain the resident's nutritional status or optimize their intake. So we wanna make sure that we're not doing damage to a resident by giving them fluid and nutrition that's going to damage and prolong the dying process in an uncomfortable manner. The way I pose this for everyone to understand when you're talking to families is to present the benefit and the burden. What are the benefits of giving them nutrition and hydration? And what is the burden at the end of life? So that they know that, gee, if we give our loved one this, this, or this, this could not be a positive thing. And here's the reasons why. So what can we do? Because goals sometimes have to be balanced um, between patient, family, your own personal values. If you are a nurse listening to this presentation or a spiritual counselor or a social worker, you have to look at your own personal values in terms of end of life. And if this was your mother or your father that was on hospice services and you wanted them to eat, are you willing to listen to the burden versus the benefit of these kind of conditions? So the IDT members that should be part of this discussion, obviously, is a registered dietitian. I always want you to know, as hospice providers, if that's what you are listening in, that you consult with the facility's registered dietitian. That's the very first thing that I do when we admit a patient in a long-term care facility that um, is having nutrition and hydration problems also swallowing difficulties. It could be a stroke patient, a dementia patient, um, where they're having difficulty swallowing. You might want to consult with the dietitian to talk about maybe getting a swallowing eval to see what other methods could benefit the patient. The nurse could be an RN and LPN, the aide, the hospice aide. The pharmacist is a very good um, person to consult with if a family is wanting to give the patient something and the physician is in agreement with this to help promote an appetite. And we'll talk about some of those medications as well. The chaplain is a very important piece to the team when it comes to nutrition and hydration, especially um, if the patient is still seeing his own priest, um, bishop, um, they can be very much worked together with our chaplain to talk about what's best for the patient. 
social worker has a lot of um, weight in terms of looking at the social aspects as well as the long-term care aspects of having to move a patient that is no longer receiving nutrition and hydration. The physician, obviously, and also the volunteer. We also have volunteers that are a um, very important part of the hospice team. So traditional goals of a balanced diet and achieving an ideal weight are sometimes and most times not realistic or appropriate at end of life. So when we admit patients onto hospice service, typically one of the criteria is a significant weight loss their ability to perform their own ADLs, their PPS score, KPS score, or where are they in the FAST scale. But the primary thing for nutrition and hydration is we're not expecting to see an ideal, ideal weight. This question comes up so often with families. Oh my gosh, he's lost so much weight. What can we do to build him up? Here's what's a good opportunity to have a discussion and sit in front of a family and talk to them about what they feel their goals for the for their loved ones should be. And then you can work through those. Traditional diets um, that restrict salt or cholesterol or sugar, they might be diabetic, maybe they're on for cardiac status, those are really no longer appropriate um, for restriction because at the end of life, we allow people to have what, basically what they want. So, of course, we don't you know, overdo it, but at this point, measuring salt intake or allowing them to have you know, um, a cocktail or a beer at end of life is certainly not prohibited because it is end of life and we want to make the patient um, as comfortable as we can. So the primary goal is always comfort. Um, I recommend that all of you highly individualize your plans of care for each patient that is going through end of life nutrition and hydration because one size does not fit all, um, especially if we're looking at imminent death. Uh, what brings comfort in the stage? What will bring distress? And the staff must be aware of ongoing changes. And we'll go into that as we go through the presentation. So comfort versus distress can be many different things. So I'm going to offer you some suggestions of what we have done um, in the past that may work and may not work. The first one is to offer frequent smaller feedings. As you know, those of you that work in hospice, um, patients no longer eat at the end of life the full meals that they did when they were much younger, obviously. And sometimes they taste buds change and they no longer have the taste buds that they did before. Or they could be Alzheimer dementia patient that is a wanderer. I know when my mom uh, was dying and she had Alzheimer's disease, she was a frequent wanderer. And I would often use finger foods or maybe hold a banana and kind of walk around the facility to make sure that I was giving her food while she was walking. Um, cravings change from one moment to the next. So sometimes people will ask for McDonald's and the next day they may pass away. Um, this is very common in end of life for people to ask for certain cravings. Never make the patient feel guilty for not trying to eat. Um, we hear that all the time where a loved one is at the bedside saying, mom, if you don't eat, um, you know, you're not going to get better. Um, forcing food and fluids, you know, sometimes can cause distress. One of the big things with cancer patients is giving them fluid um, and foods at the end of life can cause major distress. It can cause bloating, it can cause fluid in the lungs, it can cause a tumor to grow um, at a faster pace and get um, really, you know, much more discomfort in the abdomen so they have difficulty swallowing. So we have to look at the specific disease process and what the food and fluid distress is going to be. Intake during the dying process does not always improve the quality of life. It's really about the quality of life and the goals. I could continue with comfort versus distress. Um, dehydration um, prevents distressing symptoms. So one of the biggest things is people think dehydration is painful and it's not painful. It will release endorphins and may cause some erratic cognitive, cognitive impairment, um, but it causes a euphoria because endorphins are released in the brain. And so people are not looking at feeling like they have to eat or drink. What they do have though is dry mouth and membranes will cause distress if not managed. So we typically recommend that you have wipes at the bedside, a washcloth, 
um, some things for patients to suck on around their mouth. I remember quite some time ago, we had a patient in our service who loved Dr. Pepper, and I think this is even in our brochure, we emphasize the fact that whatever their wishes are, if that was one of their favorite things, we did dip a washcloth in some Dr. Pepper and allow him to suck on that in his mouth, which helped um, get rid of some of the stress that he had. If a patient is an end of life stage and has an advanced directive, according to state law, or the patient has reached an end of life stage in which minimal amounts of nutrition are being consumed or intake is ceased, and all appropriate efforts have been made to encourage and provide intake, then weight loss is the expected outcome. I know that's a lot in one loose sentence, but we do expect to see the trajectory of the illness. Remember, this disease process is the cause of unexplained you know, weight loss at the end. And weight loss is not a direct result of not eating, it's a direct result of the disease itself. Conduct observations to verify that palliative interventions, as you have listed in the plan of care, are being implemented and revised. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make as clinicians is we implement something and then we don't go back and revise our plan. Um, things could change, families change, patients change their mind. Uh, we might find that the comfort that they really need is not currently listed and we have to go back and adjust our goals. But we have to remember to incorporate the family and the facilities, um, group homes, whatever the patient is at, into our plan. So the choices that they make um, to maintain comfort and quality of life may need to be revisited from time to time. And I would suggest that at least weekly those are looked at, especially if someone is close to the end. First of all, um, there are medications too to consider. All medications should be reviewed to ensure that they are necessary at the end of life. Um, this is another area where families struggle. Um, they really believe that certain medications should not be stopped. They're getting the patient to take um, certain meds that they've been on forever. At the end of life, these may cause more problems than they have proposed anything good, and they also may not no longer work the way they did before. Typically, those would be Aricep, Nemenda, the Alzheimer's medications that worked very well in the beginning trajectory of the illness. Now, as we get towards the end, they no longer do that. The other thing that families want are medications that might improve appetite. And in the beginning or certain stages of an illness, that might be warranted, but towards the end may not be. Here are a list of some medications that have been used in the past to improve appetite. There's some steroids, um, Megase was big for a while, um, Pyroctin, Marinol, Ramaron, and there's also some pain control medications. I caution you to make sure you consult with the pharmacist and the hospice doctor and the hospice medical director if you are considering any of these medications because it depends on the trajectory of the illness whether or not they'll really do um, much good. So here's the big area that I focus on a lot when I sit down and talk to families and I encourage you to definitely sit down with families and face them and talk to them um, the way I'm talking to you now because um, the benefit of having nutrition hydration may not may no longer be the case and it may be a burden. So discuss that with them. Especially if you have patients with head and neck or esophageal cancers. Those are high incidences for choking, high incidences for the nutrition to go feed into the cancer and also major difficulty swallowing, which can cause aspiration, fluid in the lungs, um, bloating in the abdomen, diarrhea, constipation, all kinds of problems. So make sure that you're definitely talking to families. There is a very high incident of aspiration um, in those areas. We do not recommend restraints of any kind ever. Um, those sometimes tend to pose more of a problem. There are specific laws and regulations in regards to restraints. Years and years and years ago, um, I think they did do that, but no longer. Um, symptoms such as nausea is very common. Rattling, um, most of you know that as the death rattle pulmonary secretions. We do use um, scopolamine, atropine for pulmonary secretions, and we also use medications for diarrhea. Um, there's nothing worse, I think, than um, this discomfort that patients have from um, the burden of forcing nutrition and hydration. GI symptoms fail to absorb food at the end of life. So that is a big one, resulting in the weight loss. 
um, abnormal labs, and of course, pressure sores. We didn't touch too much on skin conditions, but skin conditions um, such as pressure sores um, come from fluid overload, and it also comes from artificial fluids. So this can also hasten death and aggravate, and I repeat, aggravate the dying process. I mentioned here, I just want to stop for a second and mention one of the things that stands out in my mind is patients that are Catholic. Um, Catholic um, feel, Catholics feel that um, no amount of nutrition and hydration should be stopped at the end of life. They certainly have that right to profess their wishes. Just make sure that you are explaining to them um, what overload of fluid and hydration can do to a patient at end of life. In case of doubt, a short trial of rehydration may be appropriate. So patients will ask me um, on your at your hospice, um, is it appropriate to have nutrition and hydration? It may be. It depends on the trajectory of the illness. Um, we can use it in cases of some mental confusion, but I think you need to understand that hydration and IVs sometimes, depending on where the disease process is, can be warranted and cannot be. So. The regulatory compliance for nursing homes is 42 CFR 483.25, and this is in regards to nasogastric tubes. And based on the comprehensive assessment of a resident, the facility must ensure that a resident who has been able to eat enough alone or with assistance is not fed by nasogastric tubes. Simply saying that if there is a resident that is capable of eating, whether you feed them or whether they feed themselves, then a nasogastric tube is not warranted. And so the clinical condition must clearly demonstrate that a nasogastric tube um, you know, has to be be, has to be done because there's no other way the resident could eat. And then you would look at what does the advanced directive say? Does the resident have one? And what have they said in the advanced directive? And then what is state law? So if a tube feeding is warranted and wanted, they must get an informed consent. It's essential before inserting it. Potential advantages and disadvantages have to be discussed with the patient and family, of course, and as well as potential complications. Um, resident preferences is normally given the greatest weight in decisions. So obviously if they're alert and oriented, um, you want to make sure that you are talking to them about what their ordinary means are of prolonging life and what could happen with nutrition and hydration, but they do have the final say in what they want. Family attitudes. Um, I think we've all seen this quite frequently. Um, with families that have a loved one that is imminent or their disease process is showing that they don't have much longer to live. Eating and drinking, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, is a symbolic gesture of giving love. So when a loved one is at the bedside talking to their loved one, um, they may certainly say, let me bring you some beef stew or whatever their favorite dish was. And they can certainly do that. And we can certainly try something if that's what they think they wanna do. But the end result is if there's vomiting, if there's choking, there's certain things that we wanna make sure we make the family aware of. Food is always considered a social event, as I mentioned earlier, in a celebration. Um, refusing foods in subcultures are perceived as refusing love. So I caution you to make sure that you not only know the disease trajectory, but you know the diversity of your patients. What is their culture? What have they done in the past? What, how does the family and the patient perceive food and nutrition, and then help the family refocus their energy by giving them education and help them understand how other things can be done to show meaningful ways to visit. So one of the things I think families tend to think about is how can they help? What can they do? And obviously food was always one of those areas. Now we can show them how to, um, you know, provide good skin care, turning their loved one, um, reading to them, playing music, sitting with them, journaling, looking at pictures. There's other meaningful ways to make a visit more um, beneficial. Ways to visit meaningfully also apply to lotion on the hands and feet, uh, maybe given a light back massage, moisturizer to the lips. Um, remember um, talking about earlier times, um, playing audio tapes of sounds or music. Um, talking about memories, or, or maybe just sitting in silence and share the time. Those, there are patients that actually, some of them have no one. That's where we would sit with the patient and talk to them. Um, and also volunteers are very beneficial with sitting with our patients. 
Um, when the staff become family, which is very much a part of hospice and how we provide care, be aware of the emotional attachment that families have to dying residents, um, especially people that don't have family, the staff become the surrogate family. We've had many nurses that I've cautioned about um, looking at barriers to, you know, being a surrogate family, but providing, um, you know, comfort to families, but yet maintaining um, their place with the hospice. Nurture, caring relationships, allow for grief. Um, grief counseling is very important to families at this time. This is a very important time for social worker, chaplain, and nurse to talk about um, grief counseling and how best to help the families and manage all aspects of death and grieving in a very healthy manner. Um, all of us need good memories and support as we deal with difficult situations. But remember that um, dying is a very difficult time. We'll often hear families saying, I thought I was prepared for this, but I see that I am not. And that's where our, our help may sometimes uh, come in play. Another aspect is grieving, as a lot of us know, um, doesn't always happen when we think it should. It could be at different stages of the di disease process, could even be towards the end, could be very in the beginning. We call that you know, anticipatory grief. It can also be very complicated and can also happen after the fact, after the loss of a loved one. So the role of the nurse, for those of you that are listening that are nurses, um, explain to the patient and family the risk and the benefit. What is the risk at this particular stage of the disease for us to give your loved one um, food and fluid. This is what could happen. Not that it's going to happen. The end, re the end decision is theirs and the patient's, but here are the risks that we're gonna pose to you. What are the benefits? Maybe the disease process in such a way that we're gonna just do small frequent feedings, or we are gonna do a short term of high hydration. Remember there's kidney shutdown, there's all kinds of organisms that work its way through the dying process that have different problems that occur at the end. List out for them their alternatives. I would sit down with the family and explain the risks and benefits, and then I tell them what their alternatives are. Offer comfort feedings. Um, you can offer dietary supplements. Sometimes um, we have families that are very into herbal um, things or shakes or supplements. Um, make sure that if they are, that you're getting them on the medication profile, that you are listing those, that you're educating them on those, that you're sharing that information with the hospice medical director, and that you're definitely communicating on both sides. And then also remember to accept their decision to, you know, for, for go food, because this might not be the belief that you have, um, but it is, you know, when they say, you know what, I don't want any more, I just want to be made comfortable, you need to make sure that you are um, not only accepting their decision, but following through with it. If the patient chooses food, um, it may cause harm, so make sure you minimize those risks. Um, prevention of aspiration, you know, head a bed of, up a 20 to 30 degree angle when you're feeding them small meals, sips of fluid, um, use of positional changes, and the slow assisted feedings. This is also consistent with the ANA, the Arizona Nursing Association's values when they list autonomy. So if you are not practicing those values, um, that is something that the standards for which a prudent nurse would do. Some recommendations when food and fluids are no longer beneficial, recognize and adhere to the clinical standards. Um, patients and decision makers that share beliefs and values, um, it should have it in writing and it must be supported. So I think the biggest obstacle we probably find with, with families is the patient does have their wishes in writing, but the families are not supporting it. And you come into conflict. This is when you want to have um, a meeting with all the people that are involved, use the support of the hospice medical director, the chaplain is very important in this, and the social worker. So you must be able to provide accurate information to show support. So make sure the information that you're giving to your families is accurate, you've discussed it as a team, and that you've also discussed it with the physician. Nurses must have accurate capacity to know the preference, religious and cultural beliefs. So this is um, 
you know, a big one. We talked, we touched on this a little bit with Catholics, but there's also other cultural beliefs of certain foods that people believe make them get better. So we certainly don't want to deny them as long as there's no beneficial, you know, no harm to them, I should say, and it's a benefit, we must certainly want to go through with that. Have a list of the risks and the alternatives and remember that the patients have the right to stop eating and drinking if they choose to do so. So what are the things um, that can cause harm when food and fluids are forced or families want to continue with it? These are the things you're going to discuss with them. Obviously, edema, which is you know swelling and fluid in the body. Heart failure is very important. Maybe they're towards the end, they're taking excessive fluids. Um, you see pulmonary congestion on the lungs, you see edema. Eventually the heart will fill up with fluid as we know as congestive heart failure and they will stop breathing and they'll have difficulty breathing. PEG tubes now have been known to be contraindicated in patients with dementia. If you look at the current research from the uh, National um, Organization for Hospice, um, and some other end-of-life organizations and palliative care, you'll see that at one time, um, PEG tubes were used quite a bit. Now they're no longer um, used for end-of-life. And there's a reference at the bottom of the presentation for you to check as well. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has determined when nutrition hydration is a burden when the patient has the following. Severe neurological disease. Um, in the next couple of months, we're going to be having um, you know, continuing education and some more webinars. And one of the webinars I believe we're going to be having is ALS, which is a neurological disease that we see in hospice. So some of these, you know, Alzheimer's dementia, Lewy body dementia, um, vascular dementia, all of those <clears throat> that have an effect on the neurological system as well. And total intestinal failure, the cancers of the pancreas, liver, um, some of those, the dementias we talked about. So patients at the end of life do not, and I repeat, do not experience hunger or thirst. So this is something that I think you will see air hunger, you'll see dry mouth, but I think when you provide good mouth care and frequent mouth care, and this is something that I always used to say to, to our staff, make sure that when you go into facilities that you're talking to the facility staff, the group home staff, all the caregivers, even in you know, private homes about how to give good mouth care, because really this is what's going to be the problem if we don't take care of that. We don't want our patients to be in any discomfort. At the end of life, patients are expected to not want to eat as they have no appetite. So the absence of food and fluids results in ketosis, which releases opioids in the brain, which produce a sense of euphoria. We talked about euphoria a little bit before, but this is how it actually works. So I want to make sure that you understand that euphoria is a sense of um, well-being. Um, and so they go into ketosis and, you know, this is what happens when it's released from the brain. So there's, they're generally not feeling, you know, hungry and they, they really don't even think about food, but we do because we can't imagine life without, without eating. So keep those things in mind. Um, what can you do? Um, number one, respect patient wishes. Um, address the symptoms such as dry mouth, which we talked about, human touch comfort care. And as a healthcare provider, you must understand the physiological process. So I think one of the most important things is whatever the disease process is that the patient has, make sure you are learning everything there is about the disease. I can remember um, talking at IDT to nurses and when, when, when I had a pediatric program years ago, I had 37 children on service and a lot of them had um, some sort of GI um, end of life illness or congenital illness of some kind or genetic. And I would say to the nurse at IDT, explain to us about the physiological process of this disease, what sort of nutrition hydration the child is receiving and what your recommendations are. And what I found was um, most of the time our staff were not familiar with everything there is about this disease process that the child had. So which is common if it's genetic, we don't always know everything, but if you get an admission and you don't know everything about the patient that you're taking care of and what the disease trajectory is, what could happen with each step, then you need to learn that disease. You are better equipped to explain to families what is going to happen if you know yourself what the steps are and how the organs shut down and what actually happens. So that's an important piece to this. 
So having said that, I'm going to um, open this up for questions. Um, is, is there any questions on the queue, Allison? Yeah, so we did have a couple come in. The first one is, does Arizona Care Hospice allow their patients to have artificial nutrition and hydration? That depends, yes and no. Um, we certainly do, um, if it's a patient's wishes and it is medically necessary and does impose a dangerous risk, we will certainly explain all of that to families. Um, and usually in those cases, um, if it is a risk, the families will opt not to. However, if someone wants um, hydration for a certain amount of time, we will certainly do it and we'll explain the risks, the benefits and the burdens, just like we talked earlier. Yes. Okay, and then the next question is, what are some things nurses can do to prevent discomfort in a patient that can no longer eat or drink? Um, we touched on quite a few of those in the presentation, but I think one of the biggest areas, and I can't emphasize this enough, is um, make sure you know the disease process that your patient has and what is going to happen and what's coming up next. You know, other than the mouth care is the biggest area, um, there's nothing worse, I think, than having a dry mouth. Um, and then not being able to swallow. So I think being able to provide good mouth care is probably the best one. Skin care is also very important. Um, I know when my dad was dying, I had like um, his favorite uh, music in CDs and I, I played those at his bedside, um, which seemed to calm him down somewhat, allow him to rest. Um, also make sure that your patients are not in pain. Um, we wanna make sure we're giving pain medication you know, appropriately and making sure that they're comfortable. So those are just some tips. Okay, and then the last question we have here is, how would you deal with families that are adamant about continuing to feed dying patients? Well, that's a very good question. Um, here's the thing with that. Um, if someone is adamant about it, which can happen, I think you have to do a couple of things. One, you have to, of course, go through the benefits versus the burden. Two, you have to make sure that their family understands what the patient's wishes are. And three, after all else, you've explained everything to them. This is what could happen. Um, they will go ahead in most facilities and put down a feeding tube. Um, we will definitely have our physician, the hospice physician, talk to the family as well. And typically, I have to say, in all my 47 years of nursing and 27 of them in hospice, um, I have yet to have a family that's gotten all the information make the wrong decision. So I highly encourage you to make sure that all the pertinent information is given to families and typically they will not push at the end of life. So just keep that in mind and make sure you're using your hospice medical director to intervene for you as well. Wonderful, thank you so much, Pat. That was the last question that came through for this presentation. Okay, thanks. Okay, so that about concludes um, our presentation for today. Please remember that we'll have these webinars um, once a month. Um, the next one is toward, it's towards the end of the month and we'll put out a link for you to sign up for that. Um, if you have any topics or subjects that you have an interest in um, that you would like for us to teach at Arizona Care Hospice, please make sure you send those through as well. Um, and once again, um, remember Arizona Care Hospice is, um, has three locations in Prescott, Payson, and Fountain Hills. We service Maricopa County, Pinell County, Gila County, and Yavapai County. Thanks and have a great day, everyone.